Well, hey there, this is Pastor Scott Gould, and I'm so thankful that you've decided to join us here to worship the living God. And our online worship services are available to you to help and to encourage you, to lead you in worshiping God Almighty in the name of His Son, Jesus Christ. And we're thankful that you have decided to be a part of this worship time. And we just want to encourage you that this online resource, this online worship service, should in no way uh, replace or inhibit you or anyone else from being a part of Christian fellowship with other believers. And so we would want to encourage each of us to be a part of a Christian Bible study, a Christian small group, and then continue to gather together with other believers face to face. So if we can be of help to you in any way, please call the church office. Please let us know, let me know how you would desire to be a part of Christian fellowship with other believers uh, face to face. And so may God bless you. And would you just be willing right now to open your heart to the living God and let's worship together. Well, good morning to you. We are thankful that you're here to worship Jesus Christ today, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. I don't know if you were singing that song. Your singing might be from the first verse of the, uh, of the second song we sang. I am tired, I am weak, and I am worn. Anybody that? Anybody here? Anybody here? Anybody here? Anybody here? Yeah. But what I'd like to point to is the second verse. for kids to appropriate teaching and grow uh, at, with their peers, uh, kind of disciple-making uh, opportunity for them. And so uh, that is not mandatory. Kids are not kicked out of the sanctuary. If you prefer to have your kids stay in here, that's totally fine. We have activity bags up there up front uh, and in the balcony as well, either these plastic ones or these cloth ones. So we just love kids. And we want kids to grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ, be that in here, downstairs, or at home. We want to encourage kids learning about Jesus. And then last announcement, annual meeting will be January 22nd, so mark your calendars for that. And so with that, I'd love to pray, so please join me in prayer.
Father, we thank you that you reveal to us your love and grace. That in the storms of life, in the weariness, in the tiredness, God, you are Lord. You are almighty. You control and you oversee all things. You're never taken by surprise. You're never shocked by our sin or by other people sinning against us. Lord, you know all things, and we trust in you today. We look to you for refuge, for strength. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to stand together as we confess our faith, as written in the Apostles' Creed, and that is printed in your bulletin. The Confession of Faith, the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, Christ, his only Son, Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, Spirit, born of the Virgin Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, from where he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and a life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Our first scripture reading for today is from Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 1 through 9. Deuteronomy chapter 6, beginning with the first verse. Now this is the commandment, the statutes and the judgments, which the Lord your God has commanded me to teach you, that you might do them in the land where you are going over to possess it, so that you and your son and your grandson might fear the Lord your God to keep all his statutes and his commandments, which I command you all the days of your life, and that your days may be prolonged. O Israel, you should listen and be careful to do it, that it may well be with you, and that you may multiply greatly, just as the Lord the God of your fathers has promised you in a land flowing with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God. The Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. These words, which I am commanding you today, shall be on your heart You shall teach them diligently to your sons and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be frontals on your forehead. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. The second scripture reading is from the book of John chapter 6 verses 16 through 21. John chapter 6, beginning with the 16th verse. Now when the evening came, his disciples went down to the sea, and after gathering into a boat, they started to cross the sea to Capernaum. It had already become dark, and Jesus had not yet come to them. The sea began to stir up, because a strong wind was blowing. Then when they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and drawing near to the boat, and they were frightened. But he said to them, It is I, do not be afraid. So they were willing to receive him into the boat, and immediately the boat was at the the land to which they were going. 
May God bless the reading of His Word. Good morning. At this time, we would do something brand new and release those children three years of age through third grade to head to Kids Connect. And uh, we would welcome you as a congregation to be praying as we consider how we continue to do this time of training children. And uh, I would invite the rest of us while the children are released, would you bow your heads and let's go before the Lord in prayer. And Father, we thank you for the, the commitment that you've made to us. Lord, not just on Sunday mornings at 10 a.m., but we thank you, God, that you've made an everlasting commitment to us. You've promised, Lord, where two or more gather in your name, that you make your presence known. And so, Lord, we, we want to learn from you. We would say even this morning, right now, teach us to pray. Teach our children to pray. Teach our grandchildren to pray, Lord. Teach us as a congregation to pray. Thank you, God, that you've been in that business since you walked in the cool of the day with Adam and Eve. You made your presence known to them, and we desire that you would make your presence known here to us. And Lord, I pray that you would allow it to be that our testimony would continue to be that we love to be in the presence of the living God. For in your presence, there is fullness of joy. And Lord God, as we're here today, we thank you for what you're doing in the Potomac Nazarene Church. We thank you for their pastor, Randy Holden. And we pray, oh God, and ask for your blessing upon the congregation there. Have your way with your children there in Potomac, we pray. Even as we are here, we ask that you'd have your way with us. And Lord God, we stand with the ministry, see you at home in Champaign, and we pray, God, as they're getting ready uh, for their one winter's night, God, that you'd guide them, that you would lead them in this season of ministry, and that you would bless them as they are desiring to walk alongside of those individuals without an address, Lord, that we would call homeless. Lord, we ask that you'd minister through the leadership at CU at Home. And Father, as we're here, today we stand in agreement with the church in Laos. Lord, as those Christians have been facing persecution, Lord, we stand with them and ask that you would continue in Laos to raise up the standard of the word of God, raise up the standard of the good news of Jesus Christ and encourage the pastors and the leaders of the churches and their families, oh God. We pray, Holy Spirit, that you'd give them great strength and boldness in the name of Jesus Christ. And oh God, as we're here in Gifford, we thank you for this town. As we're here in, the, in Illinois, we thank you for our state. And Lord God, we thank you for the United States of America and for the form of government that we live under. God, we ask you to continue to lead us to be one nation under you, O oh God. And so we pray in humility before you, O oh God, on behalf of our President Joe Biden, our Vice President Kamala Harris, and, oh God, we lift up the House of Representatives and the Senate, and we pray that you would lead them in your righteous ways, O oh God. Lead them in truth, O oh God. And we pray for those individuals as we pray for ourselves. Lead us here in your righteous ways, O oh God. Father, we stand in the gap with thanksgiving for the servicemen and women that have gone out from this community, from our families, our neighborhoods, oh God. 
We ask that you would guide and guard each of the servicemen and women that are serving in our country, and we pray that you would visit them with your presence. We pray for the congregations of Christian believers that are, that are meeting around the world, Lord, with our armed forces, those individuals that are calling upon you, O God. Visit them with your mighty presence today, even as we ask you to do the same thing here. Visit us, O God, with your mighty presence. And now, Lord, we take time to pause on behalf of our friends, on behalf of our families, and on behalf of our church family. And Lord, as we pause before you, hear us as we bring our request to you, those silent murmurs, the individuals that we're praying for. Oh God, we do want to remember uh, Bill Hofschneider and his family as together with him that were grieving the loss of his father tragically yesterday. Suddenly, Lord, we pray, oh God, hear us as we quietly bring our request to you, oh God. And, O oh God, as we're here together, we ask even together for the, just the filling of your Holy Spirit. Would you fall afresh upon us today, Spirit of the living God, each one of us? Would you change us because we've been with you today? Even as we would sit under the preaching of your word, would you change us today, Lord? And hear us now as we pray the prayer, Jesus, that you've taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Standing. You may remain sitting as you are as we sing the song that's on the screen. I would invite us to continue together to worship the Lord. So this praise song, um, this very worshipful song is called Oceans, and it may not be familiar to everyone. So if it's not familiar to you, I invite you to read the words and worship in your mind. Um, it is a song that is basically, what is our response when we are called into the deep of life? You call me out upon the waters, the great unknown. Where feet may fail And there I find you in the mystery In oceans deep My faith will stand And I will call upon your name And keep my eyes above the oceans rise, my soul will rest in your embrace, for I am yours, and you are mine. Your grace abounds in deepest waters, your sovereign hand will be my guide. Where feet may fail and fear surrounds me, you've never failed, and you won't start now. And I will call upon your name, and keep my eyes above the waves. When oceans rise, my soul will rest in your Without borders, let
Let me walk upon the waters wherever you would call me. Take me deeper than my feet. I know for younger people, maybe they haven't experienced this, and maybe they never will because of their cell phones, but how many of you have ever been lost, truly lost? And I don't know that my kids will ever be lost. They can type in, I, I'm at the Walmart, I'm looking for the Walmart, I'm looking for whatever. They'll never truly experience being lost. I've been lost. Uh, and I was thinking, you know, when have I been the most lost? And when I graduated high school, I took my graduation money and I pooled it with my friends. And we wanted to go to the 25th anniversary Woodstock concert in Woodstock, New York. And so we drove out there and I, I Googled it. Couldn't do that back then, but I did now. Googled it and over 500,000 people attended that concert in 1994. And we brought a tent with us, and we, we camped out for two nights. And at, at the very first day, uh, we, were, uh, we took a break from seeing the shows, and we went to the food tents to go grab something to eat. And something happened where I lost my friends. And in a sea of over 200, 300,000 people, I didn't know where they were. And I started to panic, and I started to think, well, the longer I look for them around the tents, the concession tents, the further my friends are going to get away from me. And I started to panic. And so I just started looking around. My friends were both taller than me. They're both, you know, to this day, 6'5", six, 6'6". Six, six. And so I'm looking maybe just for a tall guy, hoping maybe that was them. And eventually I thought, our tent was next to a stream. And I'm going to find the stream and walk along it until I find our tent. There were over 20,000 tents at this event. But I found the stream. I found the thing that I was looking for and found our tent eventually. And I wasn't lost any longer when I found that one thing that I knew would be there. And so today we're talking about the disciples out in the middle of the Sea of Galilee without Jesus in the middle of the night, caught in a storm, and they're feeling that sense of panic, that sense of fear. And then Jesus shows up, and everything changes. I have to admit, I was very grateful for this sermon this week. I, I, on New Year's Eve, uh, my best friend called me and said, my dad's been taken to the hospital, would you pray over us? And so I prayed over the phone, and I went to go see them, 
And the day after New Year's, January 2nd, he had already passed away. And they lost their mother nine months before that. And so my friends were going through the storm. And walking alongside them, I was in the storm with them. And so this week, this message, this text, this word from God, this assurance that Jesus walks through us even through the storm was such a blessing to me. So look with me at John chapter 6, beginning at the 16th verse. And we're just going to ask three simple questions this morning. The first question this morning is, who is in your boat? Who is in the boat? Look with me at John 6, verse 16. When evening came, his disciples went down to the sea, the Sea of Galilee, got into a boat and started across the sea to Capernaum. It was now dark and Jesus had yet to come to them. The sea became rough and a strong wind was blowing. When they had rowed out about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea, coming towards the boat, and they were frightened. If you look at these verses, you can kind of see a progression of fear here. It's evening. They're, in the, they're three or four miles across a six-mile sea. They're in the middle of the sea. It's dark. Jesus has not come to them. And you can kind of sense the fear here building. It's night. I'm in the middle of the sea. If something happens, I have nothing to save me. Jesus isn't even with me. And they're starting to be afraid. Jesus wasn't in the boat. And it's easy sometimes in our own lives to leave Jesus out of the boat, to leave him out as a part of our lives, especially when life is going well. And life was going well right now in the lives of the disciples. If we look at this account and it's in each of the Gospels. In each of the Gospels, it says the feeding of the 5,000 had just happened. The disciples had not only been a part of a miracle, they had been a part of a miracle that they themselves got to participate. They got to hand out the loaves and the fish. They got to collect the baskets of leftovers. They got to see this awesome miracle, and they got to be a part of it. And I would have to imagine as they're going across the Sea of Galilee, they're, think, they're talking about what an amazing experience that had to be. Life is good. And Jesus is not in the boat with them. We can kind of experience the same thing, where when life is good, we are tempted to leave Jesus out of it. When life is going well, we forget to let Jesus into the boat. I would just ask you a simple question. As you go through your day tomorrow, as you go back to work, and it's just a typical Monday, would your day look any differently if you left Jesus out of it? Your day today or your day tomorrow, do they look any different? Jesus, having Jesus in our lives, Jesus in the boat, should change everything about our lives. It should be like night and day, like darkness and light. Years ago, me and my dad and Cullen Hesterberg, when he was a little boy, went fishing at Homer Lake. And we went out at night, and we had the light on, and never in my life have I seen this many mosquitoes on one night. We were in a fog of mosquitoes. And so finally, I said, let's just shut off the light. Maybe these mosquitoes won't swarm us if we shut off the light. And so we turn off the light. Well, now you can't see your line. You can't see your hook. You can't see anything. I'm like, okay, just turn it back on. And when we turn it back on, it seemed to be worse. Like out of a horror movie, there were even more mosquitoes. And I said, shut off the light, shut off the light, shut off the light. But I caught something out of the corner of my eye. There was a dead tree in the water that we were heading straight towards. And so we turned the light back on and were able to avoid the tree. Now, I mentioned this story because many times in our lives, it's easier to just turn off the light. When we have the light of Christ in our lives, the light of his word in our lives, it exposes some things, some things that shouldn't be there, the sin in our lives. And so the easy thing to do, our human nature says, turn off the light. It'd be easier for me to just not look at the sin than to deal with it. 
So we need to turn on that light. The disciples needed Jesus in that boat with them. They're afraid without him. The whole thing does change when he's with them. But at this point, they're in the dark. And if you've ever been out uh, on a boat before in a large body of water, especially being from Illinois, I think, it's quite jarring the first time you look and you can't see land anywhere. Like that had to be a frightening thing for them to know there's nowhere to swim at this point. We're sunk if something happens. And so they're afraid because Jesus is not in the boat. We have to be willing to have him as the, as the, the middle, the center of our lives. He has to be in the boat, especially during the storms of life. And something occurred to me, maybe for the first time as I read this passage, usually I've preached on this before, and it's usually the Matthew account where Peter is walking on water. Uh, the John account does not talk about that, but it does talk about the storm. Jesus was not unaware of the storm. Jesus knew when he told his disciples to get into the boat and cross the Sea of Galilee that there would be a storm. And so if you're going through a storm this morning, I want to assure you, God is not unaware of your storm. God is not only unaware of your storm, but Christ is walking alongside you as you go through the storm. In the Mark account, uh, you can just mark this, no pun intended, mark this down. In Mark chapter 6, there's the other account of the Jesus walking on water. And in Mark 6 verse 48, it says, Jesus intended to pass by. Jesus intended to just walk by them as they were in the boat. It was not his original intention to get in the boat with them. And so you have to imagine being one of the disciples rowing in the boat, rocked by the waves, being blown by the storm, wondering if you're going to die in a shipwreck, and Jesus walks by. On the water. Jesus walks by on the water. You would have to imagine this would change everything. How could you be afraid when your rabbi, your master, your lord, your friend, literally walked on the water beside the boat that you were afraid of sinking in. Knowing that Jesus walks alongside us changes everything, even in the storms of our lives. What an amazing thing to think that the God who walks on water walks with us through our own storm. So is he a part of your life today? Is he in the boat with you today? So if he is, I have a second question. Where is he in your boat? Where is Jesus in your boat? Verse 19 says, They had rowed about three or four miles, and they saw Jesus walking on the sea, coming near the boat, and they were frightened. And he said to them, It is I. Do not be afraid. And they were glad to take him into the boat. They see Jesus and welcome him into the boat. And for us, what does that look like? A, a typical uh, fishing boat back then, it would have had uh, 15 total passengers around, 10 crew, four people rowing the oars, and one person at the helm, one at the wheel. And so where is Jesus right now in your boat, in your life? Or you're like, well, I just want him in the boat. I want to say I'm a Christian. I want to go to church. I want to wear the t-shirt. I want to wear my cross necklace. As long as everyone thinks I'm a Christian and Jesus is in my boat, well, then I'm good. Or do you want Jesus rowing the boat? And I would argue the majority of us want Jesus rowing the boat. Lord, I want you working in my life as long as I decide the direction. Lord, I want you to answer my prayers as long as it's the way that I would want you to answer my prayers. Lord, I want you to be doing the work in my life. I want to see the Holy Spirit working in my life, but I get to make all the decisions. Or is Jesus Christ at the helm of your life? Charting the direction of your life. Showing you which way to go. And if we think about it, it, it is comically easy to make that decision of should I be leading my life or should Christ be leading my life? 
And so I want to just kind of visualize this. Like, what does your resume look like on making decisions? And what does Jesus' resume look like? And so I'm going to give a, a self-deprecating example just over the last couple of weeks. I came into work this past week, and I was sitting at my desk, and Cindy came in to, to talk to me, and she said, did you get up early this morning? And I'm thinking, wow, she's insinuating that I look bad or I'm not like put together. I'm like, actually, I did. Why? And she goes, well, you had to have gotten dressed in the dark because your shirt's on backwards. Okay. Example number one. The week before, I had left my laptop in my office. And so I got in my van. I drove up to the church. I parked it by the stairs. I came up and got my laptop. I walk out of the church. I walk by my van into the church van and start driving it home. And I didn't realize until I got to the post office that I was in the wrong vehicle. So I came back, got my car. The final one, and the, really the, the cherry on the Sunday, is I had a young woman in the clothing center that I asked how I could be praying for her. And she you know, mentioned a couple of things. And I, and I said, and the, the little one to come, motioning towards her stomach. And I'm guessing by the groans, you already know how this story ends when she says, I'm not pregnant, actually. That's my first choice in who should be running my life. That guy that puts his shirt on backwards, gets in the wrong car, and makes a horrifying statement to a young woman. Or the other decision is the God who walks on water. The God who loves me more than I could ever love myself. The God who went to the cross for me. The God who knows all and can do all and wants to guide the steps of my life. And the crazy thing is, most of us still rely on the first guy that makes those kinds of decisions, where we say, I, I know what I should be doing. I've gone through this before, I know. We rely on our instincts, we rely on our friends, we rely on the internet, whatever it is, when we have no business making those decisions in our lives, but instead, going to the one who walks on water. Why would we not want him to be in charge? Jesus, in our, in our version that we read this morning, says, it is I, do not be afraid. In the Greek, he says, I am. In other, I, just like the Lord spoke to Moses, I am. I am the I am. I am God. Jesus says that to his disciples as he stands on top of water. It's the, it is the I am. It is God who is with you. And it says they, are, they were no longer frightened. And you think of all the miracles that happened just in this one instance. Jesus defies the laws of gravity as he stands upon the water. He defies the laws of time as he caught up to them as they were miles out. He defies the laws of space as they went from one place to two miles Later, to, all the way to the end of the sea in an instant. Why would we not want that God in charge of our lives? Why would we not want that God determining the decisions in our lives? Where Jesus says, I am God, do not be afraid. So our final question this morning, where is the boat going? In verse 21, it says, they were glad to take him into the boat. And get this, immediately the boat was at the land to which they were going. It says the boat immediately reached the land. Now this doesn't mean we can say, oh, you know what? We were having such a good time. Time just flew by. This isn't a, a, a figure of speech. The boat literally went from four miles out to six miles out in an instant when Jesus was with them. That is our God. And when Jesus is with us in our journey through life, it doesn't always look like we planned it to be. You know, I'm sure the disciples didn't say, okay, guys, we're going to get in the boat. We're going to go about halfway, two-thirds of the way. We're going to run into a terrible storm. But don't worry, Jesus is going to walk on water, and then he's going to get in with us, and then we're going to instantly go to the other side. That wasn't the plan. And when we are walking with the Lord... 
I guarantee it doesn't go the way you expected it to. And that means incredible things happening, and that also means that he walks with you through the storm. We don't plan on those things happening, but they begin to happen when we walk with the Lord. Yes, we will go through storms, but yes, we will experience incredible things through his Holy Spirit when we are walking with him, letting him decide the direction of our lives. Uh, Over Christmas break, we went and helped with the Salvation Army uh, toy giveaway. And two days before we volunteered, you probably saw it on the news, uh, somebody stole a trailer full of toys that were meant to be given away at the Salvation Army. And, And so we went to volunteer, and I was talking to the director, and he said, you won't believe it. We've had two semis full of toys come in when people heard about what happened. He said, I had a businessman give 30 bicycles for us to give away, and he wants to give 100 next year. Where God, I'm sure that wasn't the plan. I mean, when, they're probably already planning for next year's. When they laid out the plan for that giveaway, that wasn't in the plan. That was not in the plan to lose a, a trailer full of toys. But it was in God's plan that something like that could happen, and then they get to experience this incredible blessing. Like, yes, there was a storm, and I saw the Facebook post of the guy who had the trailer in his driveway, and it it, it was heartbreaking to go through that part of the storm. But then to see what God did with that as he walked with them and got got through that with them to the other side, that's what our lives look like when we start walking through the storm with Jesus. And I really do believe that this account is a picture of what our lives look like in Christ. Like there will be times when it's smooth sailing and Jesus walks alongside us. And there will be times where we go through the storm and he still walks beside us. But then he comes alongside us and in an instant, we're to our destination. We're to heaven with him. And the God of, who transcends all time and space, who's all-powerful and all-knowing, we get to be in his presence forever, in an instant. What a day that will be. I mentioned my friend had uh, his dad pass away, and as we were talking, he said his mom passed away in March. And he said, the thing that bothers me the most is He said, the thing that bothers me the most is that mom was alone for 10 months without dad. And I was able to share this scripture with him. He said, first of all, your mom was never alone. Your mom was with the Lord. And I said, second of all, we we have a God who transcends time. There's a really good chance it wasn't 10 months that it was in an instant they were together. And one day we will be in the presence of the one who walked on water. And as we come up for communion, just remember that. That the God who walks on water gave his body and his blood so that you could be with him someday in eternity. What an amazing thing to think as we stand there receiving the bread and the wine. That the God who walked on water gave that body for you and I to be with him in heaven one day. What an amazing thing to think, to know. It's promised in his word. Not not only was this a promise to walk with his disciples through the storm, Jesus promises to get us through the storm, and then one day we will be in eternity with him. Nothing else will matter. Let's pray together. Gracious and heavenly Father, Lord, thank you is not enough to think that you would Die for us. Die in our place. Take our sin upon you so that we could be with you in heaven forever. What an amazing thing to think about. What an amazing promise to know. And so, Lord, we ask that you would help us to walk in that promise. Lord, that we could walk confidently, that the God who walks on water walks beside us. What an amazing thing to think, that he walks in front of us to guide which way we should go. What an amazing, you love us so much. It's so overwhelming to think how much you love us. 
So Lord, give us that mindset today. I pray for those who are in the storm this morning. Lord, I know there's many right now who are thinking, and that's me in the storm. It's dark and the waves are rocking and and I don't know which way to turn. And Lord, I pray for that person right now that you would give them that peace that passes all understanding to let them know their God walks alongside, alongside them even on the water. You're amazing, Lord Jesus. We love you, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. As we would take time right now to come to Jesus individually, but yet together, uh, we're, we're doing something very wonderful in that we're inviting the Lord Jesus into our storm. More importantly, into our boat, as it were, but into our lives. You'll remember, most of you will remember in Revelation chapter 3, verse 20, Jesus saying, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And we would do right to politely, all of us at once, going and each one of us opening the door of the church and saying, Jesus, come in. And in the same way, individually, we can respond into my heart, into my heart. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus. Come in today, come in to stay. May these next few moments be personal for you. And may they be together moments. For we're here because we agree and acknowledge Jesus as Lord of the storm. Lord of the individual storms and Lord of the storm of sin that would seek to lead us away from him and that would lead to lead us to be willing to live with the light off and so there are three simple questions or steps that we can take together today and I invite you personally and together all of us together the first question I ask you to think about do you acknowledge and confess your sin to God And are you willing to welcome Jesus in to clean it up? If you acknowledge your sin, confessing it to God Almighty, would you agree with me by saying yes? Yes. And the second question, do you welcome Jesus into your heart as Savior and Lord? Are you willing to acknowledge the cross as not only A picture, but are you willing to acknowledge the cross as the place where Jesus paid for all of your sin? As far as the east is from the west, so far has God the Father removed your transgressions from you. If you're willing to receive cleansing and forgiveness from Jesus and through his blood, would you agree together by saying yes, yes? And then thirdly, are you willing to come forward as the ushers would lead us forward to receive communion together as tables? Are you willing to come and to receive personally, tangibly, his body and his blood? If you're willing to receive together, would you agree by saying yes? Yes. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, he gave thanks, and he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples saying, this is my body, 
given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And again, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of their sin. Do this in remembrance of me. At this time, I'm going to invite the deacon that's going to come, Michael and Christina, would you come? And we're going to serve each other. And then in a few minutes, the ushers will show us forward and you can come. And communion here at St. Paul's is open for all of us that acknowledge Jesus and are willing to receive from Him. And for those of you that have not yet been trained in receiving communion, we would invite you, even children, to come and we will pray a blessing over you.
Would you stand together to receive? Our benediction is from the passage we read, John chapter 6, verse 20, very simply, the words of Jesus. And he said to him, it is I, do not be afraid. And so as we leave this place, uh, my prayer would be that we just walk in that confidence that the God who walks on water walks with us. There is no need to be afraid. He walks in front of us to guide us and behind us to protect us and within us to give us peace, above us to watch over us. Just walk in that confidence today as we leave. Amen. Amen. It is now fellowship time. <laughs>